2 Corinthians 12. I'm sorry to bother you guys. Go ahead. Don't mind me. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 12. I want you to, um, I'm going to ask you the question in a minute. And I want you to think of your best answer. Uh, what is grace? What is it? 2 Corinthians 12, verse 8. For this thing, meaning the thorn in his flesh, I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. That was God's answer to him. That was not the answer no. And it was not what Paul asked for. It was better than what Paul asked for. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. And that's the only time you ought to say, for Christ's sake. Amen? I, am, I don't like taking Jesus' name in vain. I don't like that. I do not like it. So, if you're going to say, for Christ's sake, be quoting 2 Corinthians 12.10. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So he offered him grace. Paul accepted it. He willingly accepted it. And he knew that that was part of his apostleship, part of the work he had been given, part of the ministry. Uh, and I would say that nobody, not even Paul, nobody who serves Christ is going to be without a thorn and nobody is going to be, along with that thorn, nobody is going to be without grace that, to go along with it. Uh, some people's thorns uh, are not probably as powerful or weakening as others. Everybody's different. And so to everybody, a different measure of grace. You'll get the grace measured to you that you need because he gives you an amount to suffice that's what the word sufficient means it means it's enough all right um and when we say when we use the word sufficient it's almost like we're accepting less than what it is that we actually need or whatever but that's not the meaning of the word if you require I don't know how many breaths of air you take in a day. I'm going, to, I'm going to say 500. Maybe I'm wrong. But if you require 500 breaths of air, you're going to take 500 breaths of air in a day. You're going to take that. You don't need any more. don't need any less. You're going to have it. But that, that's fine. That's exactly what you needed. If you're running a race, you're going to need more. And so you'll get more. But my point is this. In everything that God does for us, it is exactly what we need. It's, it's, it's enough. It's, even though the Bible says, my cup runneth over, what do you do with a running over cup? You can only drink so much in a day. So you're going to get what it is that you need. So what is the definition of grace? What does it mean? Megan? Not getting what you deserve. Okay. Who, unmerited favor. All right. Melissa Kay? Forgiveness. All right. Donna? Okay. Well, strength then is, was, it was, is part of the grace package, but the definition of grace itself. Okay, is what, I'm, is what I'm looking for. You said unmerited favor. You said forgiveness, right? Cub? Unmerited favor? David? Okay. Okay. 
The Bible's going to tell us what it, it's going to define it for us. All right. So Esther chapter two. Esther chapter two. Let's start there. A lot of times when the Bible uses two words together, it's one defining another. One defining another. And Esther chapter 2 verse 17 is an example of that. And I want you to turn there in your Bibles. That way you can underline this, make a little note and say, this is how the Bible's defining what grace is. Esther 2.17, the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor. Now, some would say that's repeating itself, but yes, that's the point. That's the point, is that it is the Bible's way, and you've heard this, that the Bible is its own best dictionary, and I actually had a man that used to call me years ago. He was from Nottingham, England. And he always, you know, he spoke with a very, he was an old man, and he spoke in a very pronounced British accent. But he would always say, hello, Mike, it's Barry from England. And I'm going, you could have left the England part out, because I know where you're from. <laughs> By his accent. A lady from Australia called me one time, and, she, and I said, hello, uh, what can I do for you? And she said, oh, Pastor Mike. She said, I knew it was you by your accent. I said, I'll have you know Americans don't have an accent. You do, but we don't. She said, oh, yes, you do. But anyway, Barry from England used to listen to different uh, preachers who promoted the King James. And whenever he could get copies of their sermons in audio form, whether it was cassette or whatever, uh, he would use that and he would distribute those cassettes wherever he could. It, he, it was uh, kind of a funny situation because he used to have me pray all the time for his wife. His wife was Roman Catholic and she would not budge. But God had saved him. And I, I used to just love to hear this man talk to me. He'd tell his testimony and every time he talked about it, he'd start crying. Because it meant something to him. And uh, he's the one that taught me that the King James had a sort of a copyright on it that the, um, it's called the British uh, Royal Letters Patent and the, that King James put the Bible under the Royal Letters Patent, means it's patented, under the crown, not his name, but under the crown. So as long as there's a monarch in England, the Bible cannot be changed. You look at all the, the, uh, the countries in Europe that prior to World War II had a monarchy. And now they don't. Okay? And England still has one. And she's reigned longer than practically any monarch that we know of. And we have every anticipation that when she dies, the monarchy will continue because the British love their monarch. And that's not going to change anytime soon. But anyway, the words of the Bible are firm in the United Kingdom and they're not ever going to be changed. And he told me that the Sodomites sued Cambridge and Oxford because they administered the copyrights in England. They wanted the word sodomite taken out of the king's Bible. And the courts ruled, it's not your Bible to change. It's not even our Bible to change. It belongs to the monarch. The monarch wants to change it. The monarch can. We can't. It'll never be changed. So they lost. It. They said the word sodomite made them look bad. And I'm going, no, there's other things you do that make you look bad. Okay. But anyway, um, where was I going with that? It was really good. Oh, he came up with, he wrote out all the places in the Bible where the Bible defined a word in English. And it, and it was a long list. He ended up giving that to Gail Ripplinger, who wrote uh, New Age Bible versions, and she published it. For him, he never got any money out of it. Didn't want any money out of it. He sent me a copy of it. I don't know if I still have it, but it was a, it was an amazing thing because whatever, like the word besom, 
If you don't know what a besom is, the Bible tells you in that verse, the beast, I will sweep you with a besom of destruction. It means broom. And he just took all these places in the Bible, like where it says grace and favor. The Bible is defining the word for you. It's teaching you English and it's teaching you the meaning of the word for you. It's built into it. So if you have a question about what the word means, I've done this numerous times. I've gone to the dictionary and after finding the Webster's Dictionary meaning of the word, I would often find that same meaning in the Bible. I just didn't look long enough. But anyway, she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So when you look at, this is from the... Um, the definition I have up here is from the Webster's Dictionary, which is built into the Pure Bible Search software, 1828 Dictionary, not the revised one. The original Webster's Dictionary. Comes, the word grace comes from the word gratia. Uh, and even that word is carried down in, lang in the Latinized languages like Spanish. What's the word for, uh, thank you, in Spanish? Gracias. In Italian, it's grazie. Okay, it, it's a Latin, they're based on the, la the Latin language, French, Spanish, um, what else are some of the Latin, they call the Romance languages. But anyway, they have the same root, and the word grace is from the word grazia, which literally means free. When someone gives you something gratis, that means it's free. That's a legal term. Legal, legal definitions are based a lot upon the Latin form of these words. And gratis means absolutely free. Now, if I... Uh, if I offer you something and you accept it and I say it's free, you only have to pay the shipping. Is it free? It's not free. Okay. Companies that offer you something free, all you have to do is pay the postage and handling. The handling part is covering the cost. That cost is that is built into their handling fee we handled it and we're charging you 20 bucks because we touched it okay so it's not free now if it's free and we send it to you without you paying the postage and handling then it's free we send out about a thousand packets at the beginning of every month totally free we do not charge for the discs. We do not charge for the production of those discs. We do not charge for the postage of those, of sending those discs out. We do not charge anything for that. And God has always paid our bills. In 10 years of doing that, God has paid our bills every month. All right. So if we say free, then it must, in fact, be absolutely free without a charge to that. Um, and if you look down there on the bottom, let me underline it. The Webster's Dictionary definition of grace is favor. And that is exactly what you find in the King James Bible. A favor is something you do for somebody and they don't owe it back to you. Right? With some people, favors always cost. Because they'll say, you remember last year when I loaned you 50 bucks? You know that you owe them another favor back. Well, that's not a favor. They charged you for doing a deed. Because you know in the back of your mind, he said this is a favor, but this is not a favor. I know this guy. He's going to require it out of me somehow, some way. 
I'm going to have to pay him back for this. And it's probably, I'm going to have to give him more than what he gave me. That's how some people are. They like to use the word favor, but it's not a favor. It's a, they did it and they're going to charge you back for it. And you're going to pay them more than what you got out of them. But with God, it's a guaranteed favor, meaning it requires absolutely no payback whatsoever. And to this day, I still deal and I will continue to challenge and deal with anybody on the issue of salvation. If it's free, then it is God's favor to you and you don't owe him one thing, not one thing. You don't owe God money. You don't owe God church attendance. You don't owe God anything. But it's like what we learned uh, here last Sunday morning in the sermon. The servant who was set free at the end of seven years labor, when he was set free, he was set free, period, free. And when he was sent out, he was sent out with enough cattle and enough grain to get him by for a year until the next harvest. Not only is it did he, was he set free? He was set free with stuff. But then he had the option to turn around and offer his free service back to the owner or the debt, uh, the, who he borrowed the money from. And he could do that and it was for life, but he could do it. Now, again, on both sides, the debt has been either paid off or he's been released from the debt by the Jubilee year. And so the debt's over with and the guy coming back to work for him. I mean, obviously he has to have maintenance. So he's got to have a place to live and he's got to have food to eat. But he's coming back to serve his master free of charge. He's not requiring wages. He's not going to, after a year, go on strike and say, "You, I want more money, or I want more food, or I want a piece of land. He can't do that. He's a servant. So he comes back. So when God gives us this grace to us, it wouldn't be right for God to then require service out of us or require anything out of us. But those who are truly saved come back and we say to our master, we're here to serve you the rest of our lives and we're doing it for free because we know that we don't owe you and we know that we can't pay you back ever. We've been released from the debt and so we're here to serve you for the rest of our lives. And we require no pay. Obviously, you got to feed us, put clothes on us, give us a place to live, take care of my wife and kids. Other than that, you don't owe us anything we're not serving you for hire because then that would be different. We're serving you for the rest of our lives. Okay, that's what that is. And for then, then the Jews who came along in the early days of the church who were insistent that the church require performing acts out of the law. They must be circumcised. I'm sure then that they would have added then everything else along with circumcision because if you accept part of the law, the law says it has to be all of the law or it's none of the law. God's, that's how God views it. And so when that issue was settled, there in Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, which was, it wasn't a pope and it wasn't the office or the college of the cardinals, it was the apostles and the bishops and the elders. And they were all speaking as equals here. And the Holy Ghost came in, helped them resolve the issue, helped them to understand from Scripture that salvation to the Gentiles was always intended to be free. In fact, it was to the Jews as well. And so why should, and the, and the question was, why should we require them to keep the law when we didn't keep the law? That's why we got in the shape that we did, because we never kept the law. So uh, turn to Romans chapter 3 and you'll see it. You'll see the, actually the word free in the text. Romans chapter 3. 
verse 23. We all know that verse, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that verse ends in a semicolon, meaning the thought is not done. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But verse 24 says, being justified freely by His grace. So now the Bible is throwing in the word freely here. Justified freely by His grace. And so, Donna, you said strength, okay? Well, strength is something that God gives us by His grace. But His grace means that when He gives us strength, He gives it to us absolutely free. We, he does not require uh, membership dues, does not require, uh, he does not say, I want 10% of all your income and all your cattle and all of your real estate. I want this and I want that because then that is wages. Then we're doing it for wages. We're doing it and we owe God something back. So he gives us strength, but he gives it to us absolutely free, knowing the human nature in that not only was it not possible that we remain absolutely perfectly righteous before we were saved, he knows that in the flesh there is no good thing and there we, we are not going to be 100% righteous after we're saved. He knows that we're going to do things that are wrong. He knows that we're going to break the law once again and so God, in knowing that, then offers us His forgiveness and His strength and everything else that we have. He gives it to us without keeping the law. Without keeping the law. That means it's free. It is unmerited favor. It means that it does not, it is not hinged on our merits. Okay? A merits system, you might have a merit system at work where if you work for a year without taking any sick days, then you might get some sort of merit, a financial merit, or you might get an extra day vacation or something but they're keeping track of the good work that you do and the good deeds that you do. You might get a bonus of some kind um, whereby you did extra work or you worked longer hours or you, you saved the company a million dollars and for that you're going to get a hundred bucks. Never understood that, but okay. But anyway, but it's a merit of some kind. You're, you're getting merited uh, favors, merited blessings or merited uh, income or some sort of, of thing given to you, all right? But with unmerited favor, it is the idea where God has established this idea that we cannot live by a merit system with God because he's already said in the Old Testament in Ezekiel 33 that if you are a righteous man, in the day that you commit unrighteousness, all your righteousness is gone. So let's say that, let's say David, where he works, he's, he's, been, he's been well for 364 days of his work year. And on the last day of the year, he ends up with the flu and can't make it to work. And so he was one day away from getting his merits for not having any sick days and he blew it the last day of the year and he doesn't get it. Because all of that then is gone. The, the idea was if you go without any sick days, then you get a week's vacation. I'm just assuming, I'm just guessing, okay? But the idea is he blew it, he got a sick day, he doesn't get the week's vacation. And if you look, if you've ever read the terms and conditions on any kind of sweepstakes or lottery or at Publishers Clearinghouse or McDonald's Monopoly game or any of that, there's ways out. 
that they don't have to pay you if you don't qualify under the terms and conditions. Right? So, you say they owe you a million dollars, but you were disqualified because your first cousin works for McDonald's or you work for McDonald's. You don't get the prize. So that's the point. If it's free, it is unmerited. It's not based upon how good you are. Am I getting amen on that one? Because it's not a good contest. Paul said, finish the race. He didn't say finish it first. Who's going to finish it first? Not me. I already know I'm not. So, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And again, either Christ has died for all of your sins or He died in vain. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. Yes, faith is required but faith is your where your heart is not works of the law through to be a propitiation that means he has satisfied the just demands of the law and of God propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And God can justify anybody that he wants. Am I right on that? Because he said... I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy and I'll have pardon on whom I have pardon and you ain't got a say in it. You can't tell me who I can and cannot forgive. You, just like you cannot tell somebody who they can and cannot love. Amen? Love, like, just shows up. You look at a girl and you're going, I'm in love with her. And there ain't no stopping it, right? Okay? So, grace is freely given gifts that are totally unmerited to them who believe. You might want to write that down. That was a long sentence. Grace, what did I just say? I forgot. That's why I told you to write it down. Grace is freely given unmerited gifts to them that believe. Is that close to what I said? All right. So he's a justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. You believe, you believe his word, then God justifies you. In other words, the, the debt of sin that's in, your, that's in your column on a spreadsheet or an accountant's ledger, all of the sin that's totaled up, has been wiped away and it says zero balance. That means there is no judgment that can be put in against you because there is no sin. Right? What was it that Pilate had an issue with when it came to crucifying Jesus? What was his number one hang up? He didn't do anything wrong. So why am I sending him to the cross? I've got Barabbas. He's done everything wrong. You want him? Yeah, we'll take Barabbas. We want you to kill Jesus. And Pilate was going, I don't want to do this. But he's a politician. So in order to not have a Jewish riot, he offers them Jesus to be crucified. But Jesus had done nothing wrong. But that was the plan of God. To take the one who had done nothing wrong. This is why in the Old Testament, animals were a substitute. The sacrifice of animals. Can animals sin? No, because there isn't a law 
given to them. There's not one of God's laws that's attributed to them. And none in the Ten Commandments, thou shall not poop in the neighbor's yard. Okay? That would be for the dogs. He didn't write that in there. There's no law. There's no sin against animals. So animals were the substitute to represent Christ who had not broken the law. Not done anything against God. So Christ is the lamb and he becomes the propitiation. He's the one that provides our justification and the clearing of our debt absolutely free. And we that serve him, serve him today and will serve him the rest of our lives, not out of debt and not for wages. Joyce Myers has this wrong. Joyce Myers teaches everybody that she deserves to be rich because she obeys God. She's a liar. She is a liar. She says, I do what God says. Therefore, this is why I have all this money. And I have a private jet, and I have a house at the Lake of the Ozarks, and I'm wealthy, and everybody reads my books, and everybody likes me, except for me, Joyce. Okay? So, anyway, it's a free, freely justified, free gift to those who believe. And will be. It'll stay that way. Father in heaven, teach us grace. Teach us, Father, that the grace that you have given us, teach us, Father, how to, number one, live in that grace. Number two, to serve you by that grace. And then, Father, to minister grace to others. To do things for people that maybe we think they don't deserve or to do things for people and not expect anything back. Teach us to do that. Teach us, Father, to not treat everybody in our life as if we're going to do things for them, but they're going to owe us back. Father, that ain't, that's not Christians. That's not right. So teach us, Lord, what grace really means and not how we've sullied it. And Father, teach us to live in that grace and thank you for it every day because that's why it's there. Thank you for loving us, God. Help us to love others. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.